Hi, I'm Mike Marino, and this is a brand new episode of Live from My Mother's Basement. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or hey, maybe good morning. I don't know when you're watching this show. Welcome to another edition of Live from My Mother's Basement. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that part? It's just funny. I'm, I'm glad it's funny. Well, we're not really in the basement. This is the makeshift basement in Los Angeles, California. But hey, you know what? We travel. We're comedians. We're never in the same place too long of a period of time. I wish we were in the real house where I grew up in the basement. You we're would gonna love do it. it. We're going to do yes, it. Yes, we're going to be on tour somewhere. You come over, yeah. we'll do the show again. Absolutely. So you get to see what that actually looks like. But here we are in Los Angeles, and I am with the lovely, the most talented one of the most outstanding female entertainers. I say entertainer, not just comedian, because she does everything. Thank you. Monique Marvez, ladies and gentlemen. Yay, Mike Marino. Thank you. My friend. Thank you. What Holy shit. I got you. I got you. We've recently done some shows together in Florida. We have. And they've been a lot of fun. She walks out on stage and just blows the room away. And then she says things like, do you mind if I go first? I'm in a hurry. I got to catch a plane. I'm like, do, <laughs> do what you want. Whatever you want. It's so sweet. And then she'll do things like this. You know, I work with your brother. He's really good. He's <laughs> very nice, too. Yeah. Well, hey, we're, we're kind of normal. Very. Normal very. entertainers. I don't know if you like being called a comedian or a stand-up. I like to say entertainer because you could do a movie. You could be an actress. You, I don't know if you sing or not. I have. I don't know if you play oh, an have. instrument. but Piano, but not well. A lot of different... Uh, portions of the showbiz so doesn't that make you an entertainer yeah i entertain for a living exactly in many different ways it's funny because i usually write writer performer okay because to me performer is just you bring things to life you bring a story to life you perform to me even a little joke is a mini movie it's a 15 second mini in my mind i'm thinking of how that joke is funny to me and why it's funny I'm in the moment thinking, and so I tell people when I mentor them, a, a, a joke, a, a 15 second setup punch joke has to have a beginning, a middle, an end, a plot twist, a surprise element, you know, and and, uh, and you have to think about why the movie's good. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that right up top because to me, I don't even know if I'm going to say this right, I look at female comedians and I'm like, they're geniuses. They have to be almost more talented than a male comedian because they have it harder than we do. Amen. There's a lot less of them, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. They don't work as much as we get to work because supposedly we, we have power and we because get paid we're less. a male. Maybe they get paid less. We that, do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I look at you, and when we were talking just before we did the pre-record, I'm like, man, she's just so smart. Look at all the things she knows. Thank you. Is it that we have to be smarter than the average person because we're comedians? We recall life. We know so much about so many different things so that you could be on top of your game in case you're thrown a curveball. Mm -hmm. But I know that you are. Thank Let's you. rewind. Where are you actually from? I was born and raised in Miami. Uh, I say it in my act. Oh, that's right. Cuba. Okay. Well, hey, capital you got to let Cuba. everybody know that. Yeah, no, no. Capital of Cuba. No, when I say that, I mean, it's one of my stalwart, you know, I know this is going to get them when I say this. So Miami, Florida, capital of Cuba. Um, people always ask what I am because I have one of those polyethnic faces that wherever I am, people think I'm them. I'm Hawaiian. I'm part Korean. I'm a little bit Filipino. Like wherever I am, Alaskan, Inuit, people always think I'm them. And I love that. Uh, but here's the real, the skinny. Um, Puerto Rican, Venezuelan, Cuban. That's my background. I wouldn't have thought Puerto Rican. Yeah, I'm tall. When I think Puerto Rican, I think of a New Yorker. Yeah, well, you think a New Yorican. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And I have family that are New Yorican, so I know. I never heard that term. Well, the, are you kidding? You have never heard of New Yorican? No. Oh, it's a thing. My family refers to themselves, my mother's side, as New Yorkans. And uh, they're... They're New Yorkers. They just happen. You know, I think it was hilarious that people didn't know until the hurricane that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. Like, it's a big joke that Puerto Ricans born in Puerto Rico have American passports. I only know that Puerto Rico is an American area because my cell phone works when I get off the ship. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, but yes, it is. Uh, and, and usually Puerto Ricans being islanders, you know, 
are smaller people, tanner people, curly haired people. It's, it's just part of the Caribbean. And I think I have more of the Venezuelan and that I'm taller. I'm, you know, high cheekbones. It, it, it's just a Yeah, you mix. do look a little different than the average. Puerto Rican. I would think. You are taller. How tall are you? I'm 5'6". Oh, wow. Okay, taller, yeah. Five, six, yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first came to California and I was meeting Latinos or Latinas, whatever it was, and Mexicans, and everybody would say to me, yeah, I'm Mexican, I'm Mexican. I go, you mean Puerto Rican? <laughs> well, it's just the reverse for me. When I say I'm Latina, they go, you don't look Mexican. I'm like, I'm not Mexican. There's a whole lot of Latinos. Just like a Belgian person isn't the same as an English person. Right. An Argentine isn't even, even similar to, you know. Uh, Told you comedians are smarter than the <laughs> average bear. See all she knows? I didn't know. All I knew is coming from New Jersey and New York in that little clustered area, uh, you went and got Puerto Rican food and you went to a Puerto Rican neighborhood to get it so that you had it right and you had friends who were Puerto Rican. So when I came to California, Reasonable. people were telling me that they're Puerto, they're Mexican. I go, you mean you mean Puerto Rican? Because I didn't even know that there, there was that much of a difference. Enormous, enormous cultural differences. Mm -hmm. There's actually a very good Puerto Rican restaurant right near here. Is that right? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Mofongo, which is a traditional. Sounds like a curse word. It does. I love saying Mofongo. It. Mofongo. Stop! But what are you yelling at me for? <laughs> but it's a, yeah, it's a traditional. Um, Puerto Rican dish, the mofongo. So oh, it's, is that? Yeah, it's on Lancashire. When I was in uh, high school, my girlfriend was from the Dominican Republic. And uh, that was my education because I would go over to the family's house and her mother and father looked black, quite honestly. Well, and, and when you say quite honestly, it's called Afro-Caribbean. There's oh, no reason not to say okay. that. It's but okay. You're allowed. They did. And, uh, yeah, just because you're black doesn't mean you can't speak Spanish. They're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> To us in that area, it was like, you love these people or not? Because we pretty much don't give a shit about yeah, yeah. any kind of racism. Yeah, it was no, just the way it was. It's a double threat. You're black and you speak Spanish? <laughs> Crazy. I always just said, well, I'm Italian, so let's eat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm Tell like, me what you have. And that's really all I knew. Exactly. But um, I'm glad about that because, you know, when you know a lot about your culture, you could bring the funny from it. Absolutely. And and it's not offensive because it's about your life. Amen. Unless somebody's really just off the cuckoo bird. I, I had off the cuckoo bird last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and, and uh, I was in East Bay. It's funny we're talking about this because I wasn't sure what to do about it. East Bay. I was, in, I was in San Francisco, but I was playing Alameda Comedy Club. And there were two very large girls that walked in, large girls, dressed in like drindle skirts. I mean, I'm not even kidding. They look like extras on Call the Midwife. You know what I mean? Like they were like a look. They look like like they came out of a out of a gypsy camp. You know what I mean? And I knew they weren't like regular. There was something going to be up with these two chicks, you know? And they were three quarters in the bag by the end of the middle. They were talking the whole middle's act, disrupting the middle. Then my act, they're like talking, and I'm catching every like little words, and they're talking loud, and they said something in Spanish, and I responded. And I said one of my classic lines, I know like I, I look like a middle-aged white woman with good credit, but I'm actually an aging Latina and I'll shank a bitch. You know what I mean? Like just to let them know I know Spanish. And then I said some Spanish stuff to them. And then the one of them's like, you know, my family, I'm, I'm from South America. I go, well, that's a pretty huge region. Can you get a little specific? You know what I mean? Like it's very big. It's a lot of different kinds of people. She's like, Amazona. And she starts getting from Tiki Taki. You know, she's like going all crazy. I think she's going to like, kill a goat and drink its blood or something, you yeah. know what I mean? It's getting wacky. And it's just getting weirder and weirder. And the audience is getting tense and we're going back and forth. And she goes, you know what you ought to do, what you need to do? I said, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to figure out how to get back to my show and disengage with you without offending you or hurting your feelings. Because I know that this isn't about me. There's just, you know... The audience went crazy cheering. Wow. Crazy. Very intelligent. And then she, she, because she said, well, I'm not from there, but my people, my ancestors, now, the old me 15, 20 years ago would have said, yeah, I can tell. You're like, you're, you know, you, you, you sell sofas and, you know what I mean? Like, I could have easily just said, yeah, you're talking all this talk, but at the end of the day, you sell empanadas in Walnut Creek or whatever. I could have just, <laughs> I, I, there were 15 things going through my head that would have decimated her. And I, I just remember thinking to myself, you're not that person. That's not why God gave you this 
the speed or intelligence, you know, like, and the way I said it, and I said it from my heart, I was like, I really don't want to do the thing I, I could do. I just want to get back to the show. And the audience went bananas with support, you know, and, uh, and they, and they piped down and I finished the show. Nice. And, and I, and I thought about it this morning of sort of the evolution of comedy and how the gen, why I resonate with the kids, which is another story, which is they're tired of mean. Nobody wants mean anymore. Right. We're so tired of mean, Mike. Uh, We're so tired <clears throat> as a society, as a species. I wonder what happened. Of mean. I don't remember being this mean. No, we, 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 the kids can't take it. Did the pandemic cause all of this shit? I mean, uh, it's a it's a bigger story for another day. But right. I can tell you right now, the kids. I have a during the pandemic, I was discovered by the kids, and my fault. My demographic is kids. Like tw I'm going to tell you, 21 to 35 is my demographic now. That's a young demographic. It's a good demographic. It's a great de because but they see me online. And they like my stuff, and they see she's, she's. I'm not bagging on anybody. I'm not political. I'm not. I managed to say a lot, without separating or severing anything. Which is a kind of a thing. It's a great thing. Thank you. So Miami, going back again, I really don't know a lot of people from Miami. I don't know a lot of people from Florida. No, most what people. It, what was it like go. growing up in Miami? Peculiar. It's a, it was a very peculiar thing, because I didn't I didn't know that we weren't the you know the the main people you know what I mean like technically we were a minority you know on paper but but I I never knew that like I thought Spanish was a secret language my family spoke you know what I mean like I tell people your home is a kingdom this is your Mike's basement this is your kingdom right. it's my kingdom your kingdom and. <laughs> And your kingdom, you're the king, right? I'm the king of my, my dad kingdom. was the king. <laughs> so I tell people, when your children are little, you're teaching them foreign policy. You know, your house is a, is their world, and how they interact with other countries, other children, other households in right. school, really comes down to you teaching your children foreign policy. You have to think of it in that term, that big. And, and I'm so grateful that my dad was a very smart man and I was raised in a very particular way, which is, you know, this is my country, uh, you know, whatever. At that time, 35th Street in Miami was my country. And when I went to other people's countries, I was always infinitely curious and respectful. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I, never, I never knew a black person personally until I was in second grade because I, in in I grew up in a particular neighborhood in Miami. We didn't have. I went to private. I went to Catholic school, private school. Right. And when we moved to another neighborhood, we were in public school. Right. And and I and oddly enough, I didn't know I was a minority, being a Latina child in North Miami Beach, which was predominantly white, mostly Jewish. I didn't even know Jewish people were a minority. You know. So this little girl named Karen moved from Jamaica, and they used to pair the new kids up with you know a kid to like guide them. So oh, the really? teacher, yeah, you know, in school, the, the, you know, just like the buddy system to teach you where the bathroom, you know. Yeah, yeah. So they yeah. paired me with Karen. Uh huh. And I and I and I told her outright that I was very curious because, you know, she was very unique to me, and she had braids. I asked her if I could touch her hair. She touched my hair. She liked mine was silky, and hers I could make the braids stand up and it would stay. And I thought that was amazing. And it's I I didn't know like I wasn't raised to think. You know, this is a black person and this is who they are and what they do. Like, that was not our foreign policy. I was just curious about everyone. Right. You have brothers and sisters? I had two brothers. One passed suddenly during COVID. I think we talked about it oh briefly. Oh, my God. It was the worst. I don't, it was the worst. It, it decimated <sighs> me. It cut the legs out from under me. It was super close. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very close. How old? 55. 55. Married with kids? No, thank goodness. The other one, I mean, here's the sad part. The other one's been divorced twice and has three kids. The one that passed had been with the same woman on and off since 1985. Wow. 88, 88. He was a kid, you know. She, he was a jazz musician. She saw him performing. 
And about every five years, she'd break up and say, if we're not going to get married and have kids, I need to get married and have kids, and would break up with him. Six months later, she'd be back and say, yeah. I'd rather have you, then, no yeah. marriage and no kids. And and they went on like this until <laughs> menopause like took it off the table, and he died in her arms. How? I mean, it's a massive heart attack. At 55? And, oh. he, and he wasn't even that heavy, but my family, you know, families have a thing. Like my family, we got a lot of heart things. I, I don't, thank goodness, but I don't eat meat and I don't smoke and, you know, I watch what I do. Right. Just because, cautionary tale, you know. And the other brother? The other brother's already had a stint put in <laughs> and, he's, and he's six years younger. Um, and he's fine, married, children. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I remind him, you're sedentary, you're an architect, you need to get out there. So there's three of you. Yeah, too are you, the, are you the middle child? Oldest and only girl. Oh, really? Wow. I'm the middle child. They always say the middle child's, uh, the middle kids are the ones who do something different than the norm. I'm not even remotely funny when I'm not on stage. You mean I'm boring? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of bookish. <laughs> I could see you're bookish. I'm I mean, very you're very bookish. intelligent. In high school, I was I'm called not walking bookish. encyclopedia. I'm very bookish. You see? I knew it. <laughs> Your references. I'm like, how'd she know that? <laughs> you read a lot. Okay. So then what made you get into the stand-up world or the showbiz world? Um, here's a weird... Very young? Very, well, my whole... It started out when I was literally in kindergarten. Kindergarten. And I think it's because I had a good memory and I was smart. So when we did the kindergarten play, kindergarten graduation play, I'll never forget it. Why are you laughing? Because that's, it seems like this is what we all did, because yeah. I remember being in kindergarten, and I'm yeah. like, I want to be the tree. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'd be a good tree. <laughs> yeah, it was about the little gingerbread man, how he ran away, and how I, as the baker who loved him, had to go through the forest and say, like, have you seen the little gingerbread boy? And finally, at the end, we're reunited. It was played by a little boy named Raymond. And, um, and so we would stand in a circle to rehearse our parts. And I would go around and to the bird and go like, hey, did you, you know, have you seen the little... And be like, eh, eh. I'm like... Look, my parents are going to be in the audience, you know. That's a that's I, I'm sure I didn't say that's lame, but I went around to every child and coached them. Like if you're a tree, if you're a toadstool, like this is how a toadstool would respond, you know. And the teacher just let me. I like directed the and 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 at the end, you know, my mother made me a little costume, I had little <laughs> plastic glasses so I could look like a granny. And and at the end, um it would it it went well for everyone. And I remember being very proud that I had participated in something that had entertained the kids. But here's the thing. You're an actor. You know things. There's always the A story, the B story, and the runner. Yeah, yeah. And the runner's what ties it all together. Right. The A story is I was, you know, I enjoyed entertaining people. Because the B story is that my dad was manic depressive. And from the time I was a little child, it predates even understanding i don't know when it started i would entertain him i would i would impersonate people into a salt shaker and put on variety shows and i was so in tune to his emotions i felt that i was like the steward of his emotions that i knew that if i if i saw the it was like seeing a bracket on a shelf break and you're going to just see everything slide off and i would know when the bracket was given way and when the bracket was given way I would I would say, Dad, I've you know been rehearsing. I got a show for you, you know, and I and I and I feel like the combination, you know, I'm sorry I'm being so verbose, but the combination of feeling the need to entertain him before I even knew that's what my my job was as a kid in right, the family, right, kind of made it like if I'm gonna do it anyway, let me be good at it. If this is what I'm destined to do, let me just be really good at it. So then you kept doing this right through, like, say, junior high, high school, Yes, yes. And college. then I tried to be normal. I, I, I got married. I married my high school sweetheart. I wanted to have a family. And nothing clicked at all. Nothing clicked. You got married out of high school? I got married at college, 21. Right. But I married my high school sweetheart. Nothing clicked. And then when I got divorced, I open mic'd. Uh, and then it, everything clicked. And it literally went like that. Like, it just went like that. In Miami? Yeah, at Coconuts. Coconuts? Yeah. I never really did the Miami circuit. I'm not extremely I'm sure familiar with it, but I heard stories. Oh, yeah. yeah. The owners basically just used the clubs to run drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't hear those stories. Oh, they were incredible. But that's great. So you're cutting your teeth as a comic starting in Miami. Mm -hmm. 
And then when did you make your way to Los Angeles? Well, interestingly enough, I started in Miami in like the regular clubs, you know, the improv and coconuts. And, um, but my, my act was conversational and storytelling and I dressed up, you know, I like to dress up. That's what Latina females do, I, you know, at a time when everybody was, all the girls looked like boys, they were like, you know, they were wearing the jacket jeans, with the patches sneakers. and jeans. Yeah, no, I was like in high heels with the girls out, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, <laughs> and some, yeah, oh yeah, I see it. So some, <laughs> some, how, uh, somebody recommended that I do comedy on South Beach and like the gay bars. That had never occurred to me. But I just, somebody, a friend of a friend said, oh, Mo- I saw Monique at so-and-so. She should come do a night. We do like comedy and karaoke at this gay bar. And I went to the gay bar and I did my act. And it went like a house on fire. Oh, wow. Like a house. And then that was it. Like all I did was South Beach and gay bars and music rooms and little, you know. And um, Why was that, do you think? I'm going to tell you right now because oh, okay. the gay community got all my references. Right. <laughs> they, they got them. You Smart. Know? So, so, you know, and, and because of that, then I got written up in the New Times, which is, you know, they're all, you know, they always have an independent paper in every city. And the New Times wrote me up as best new talent. And the Montreal saw me. And I was a new face in 92. So the trajectory was incredible. I was in Montreal two years after I started open micing. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was fast. That's very fast. Very fast. I think I was doing stand-up 15, 16 years before I even went to uh, Montreal. I had auditioned for Montreal probably six, seven years in a row. And then I gave up. And my auditions were always for the Wise Guys of Comedy, Italian show. Right. And then one night, I was just at the improv, just doing my show. And somebody came up to me and said, I'm in charge of talent at the uh, Montreal Comedy Festival. You need to be in the Italian show. I mean, <laughs> geez, okay. But it, doesn't that happen so often in our career? I guess, In yeah. so many weird ways. It just happens. I always think I'm the only one that it happens to No, like that. no, no. I've like, been fighting for 30 years now. <laughs> yeah, no, tr- trust me. I can tell you 20 stories similar to that. All right, well, now you're doing your thing. You're in Montreal. You're starting to take off as a comic. When did you come over to... Uh, the dark side here in Los Angeles. Uh, I moved July fourth uh, weekend. I was driving, um, but I technically didn't didn't like start performing. Nineteen ninety six. Right. But prior to that, I was I had a fake phone number and a PO box that was a private PO box, so it looked like an address. So people thought I lived here since ninety four. Oh wow! <laughs> Remember, when you could rent a phone yeah, number. Yeah. <laughs> you could rent a phone number for like twelve dollars a month that sounded like you had a LA phone number. It was phone yeah. banks. It was a phone bank. So I had a three one oh number in nineteen ninety five and people would leave messages and go, You never pick up. You never no matter what time I call you, you never pick up. It's cause uh, it's it's a phone bank. I'm never yeah. there, you know? But yeah, I had a I had an LA phone number and a PO box at a private place that said sweet one twelve. <laughs> Uh, it's my office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since 95. And then I moved here permanently summer of 96. All right, so you've been out in California for a while. A minute. You're working the uh, the industry. You're a big name. Everybody knows who you oh, are. That's so sweet. You've done almost every comedy club or at least the situations that you want to. Tell us about the, um, I know you were talking about is it the women of a certain age? Funny women of a certain age. Funny women of a certain age. Carol's. How did that come about? I've known Carol Montgomery for longer than either one of us likes to admit mm-hmm. because she used to do a show called Crazy Girls. She hosted a show in Vegas for years that was like a semi-burlesque strip club show at the Riviera, which doesn't even wow. exist, called The Riv. We oh. called the Riviera The Riv, right? And she hosted Crazy Girls. And in the mid 90s before I even moved here they want they were looking for a replacement because she was ready to move back to New York she did that to give her son some stability he's a grown man now right so I sat in a few replacement shows for her and uh, you know it, it, it was fun it wasn't my cup of tea the the sidebar of that which I'm sure you know this is that um, the guy that ran the room ended up being Bobby Bacala uh, oh sure uh, yeah yeah Steve Sharipa. Steve Sharipa. he used to call me and he go, Monique. Mm-hmm. He'd say, not you, but do you know any females that would do stand-up topless? Not you, just curious if you know any. It pays well. 
So one day he called. I go, Steve, it's my birthday. He goes, Monique, old chicken makes the tastiest soup. <laughs> that was my last conversation with Steve Sharippa. Let's tell everybody that's listening and watching from different parts of the world. The Riviera was probably one of the oldest, iconic Beautiful. casinos in Las Vegas on the Las Vegas Strip. Mm -hmm. And it had uh, an iconic comedy club, but even before that, some of the most legendary entertainers on the planet performed there, maybe even by Sinatra and Shirley Lucille McClain. Ball, Shirley I saw McClain. Shirley McClain do a one-woman show called The Gypsy in My Soul, and her opening act was David Brenner. I was 18 years old. Holy David shit. David Brenner opening for Shirley McClain's one-woman show, The Gypsy in My Soul. Just one of the most iconic Amazing. casinos. I think they used it for many different movies. It was in Casino. It was, it was in, in the movie, the movie cas Casino. Yeah. And... Uh, if you were so blessed to get a spot there, I remember I first played the Riviera, I hosted the show, and you're like, wow, I made it, this is amazing. Then time moves on and you become a headliner and your, light, your name is in lights outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you see the iconic, and I would love to know where it actually is. I wish I had the opportunity to take something from the Riviera so I can have memorabilia. But you say crazy girls, and the uh, display of the crazy girls in gold statues was right. in front right them all holding each other yep and it was all the, the you know the back sides with their legs crossed yes. and the and the, the line was no ifs ands or buts yes yeah and they isn't were that great. something and that's where she was doing the show carol, carol. was doing it for years she, wow. did, she was the hostess of crazy girls so she called me during i didn't the, know it was topless she had to go topless no 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 but steve was just always looking to do side oh. things <laughs> like i hosted there was Comdex was the world's largest computer convention back in the day, Comdex in the 90s. And uh, they would always do a special show because it was all men. So they did a show one year with all the penthouse pets, which was burlesque. Then they were topless. And um, I hosted it, but I, I wore a very tight gown with the girls out, but not, you know. And it was just funny because it was very interesting to be working with these girls. And they're like, who did your boobs? You know, like that backstage, like very... You know, they were very casual about their, their lives. And one of them was, uh, she had been in the original Caligula. And, oh, wow. Yeah, and she was penthouse pet of the century or something because she, she knew Bob Guccione very well. And, he you know, Bob Guccione produced yeah. Caligula, right. So she was like penthouse pet. And these girls, like their experience, when we talk about like Me Too or whatever, you know, whatever, like to hear the stories of these girls and their lives, and it was fascinating. It was really fascinating, but it reminded me, like, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Holy shit. I don't want to do this night after night. I wish they never got rid of the Riviera because it was such an iconic thing to do, and you had that nice week of performing. Yeah. And you were down the, down the strip. I remember one time I performed at the Riviera. I think it was New Year's Eve, and it snowed. Oh. And you're outside looking up going, What? How lucky am I? Snow. All this and snow. You never see snow. Well, well, I don't know how often it snows there, but it snowed on that New Year's Eve. And you remember looking at the outdoor escalators going, there's snow on the escalator. Yeah. Are they going to stop them? <laughs> I did New Year's Eve of 98 going into 99. So, you know, that was like, it's one year off from, you know? This is why you know you're, an, you're a genius. You remember years. I never remember oh, what I remember. date, what I can time, tell you what, what I was place. wearing the Holy first day of shit. second grade. <laughs> 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 I can. But yeah, it was, it was, I worked with Carl LeBeau, rest in peace, and Kenny Rogerson. Uh, I, he might be alive. I don't know who Kenny Rogers is, but I do know Carla Bow. Right. And or we, of Car. Yeah, Carl. We, were, we were at the MGM Grand, and across from us in the small theater was Prince. Oh, really? Yeah, it was unbelievable. The real Prince, because the now they have a impersonating Prince. Yeah, I not, think he's in the Rio possible. or something like That's that. That's not possible. No, no, he was actually in the Tropicana, because now the Tropicana, of course, is going to get imploded. There's another you know, that legendary... That kind of breaks my heart. Isn't it sad? But I'm going to tell you a little something about the Trop if you're in Vegas. Bef long before they built the Bellagio, when the Trop was the thing, you know, back in the Desi Arnaz days, you know, that glass that's over the entrance tables yeah. is the largest piece of Tiffany glass on earth. That is more valuable than the Chihuly at, at the, the Bellagio. So I'm certain some architectural salvage is going to go in there <clears throat> and figure out how to take down. You know what I'm talking about, that yes. dome? Yeah. That is 
Tiffany glass, that all of that whole dome at the entrance. Everybody that goes, I could be like a docent. Everybody that comes to Vegas, I'm like, let's go to the trop so you can see the Tiffany glass. And then I point it out and they're like, oh my God, it's beautiful. I never noticed it before. Yeah, well, usually people who are just downstairs gambling really don't look up. But if you go upstairs, which is the same level as the ceiling that she's talking about, that's where the legendary Laugh Factory is. But before it was the Laugh Factory, it was the Stop the Trop, which I Rodney's. never played then. Rodney and then Dangerfields. Rodney Dangerfields. That's where Could Rod you imagine that? Rodney's, yeah. Rodney Dangerfield's Comedy Club is going to be imploded. I'm a little... In I, April. I don't get busted up about stuff. That bothered me. Yeah. The, the Trop bothers me. It's very I think sad. I was there when the Dune was imploded in 93. Uh, that was the first time I played Bally's. And you saw it? Yeah. The explosion? Well, I saw, you know, on I TV. didn't like stand on, I didn't stand out on the sidewalk because I didn't want to get... I would. <laughs> I would love to uh, see any of those buildings. Well, I don't want to see them get imploded. No, no. But I if it was going to happen, I wouldn't mind seeing what that looks like. Yeah, the dunes didn't bother me. Uh, but something about the trop going down kind of bothers me. And maybe it's because my dad loved it. You know what I mean? Like it's one more thing that my dad and I talked about that's gone. It's a legacy, a legacy, you know. They had the Mob Museum there. Mm -hmm. Many, many different entertainers from around the world played in there. Regular shows. Um, there's a regular show in there right now. Uh, who? It's a legendary comedian. Now his name is going to escape me, but it makes you wonder where he's going to go perform now. It's not Rich Little. Rich Little. That's what I was thinking. Okay, it is Rich Little, yeah. Impersonator. Been doing stand-up for God knows how long. He's probably... In his mid-80s somewhere. He's been doing it my entire life. Because yeah. I remember seeing him on Sullivan when I was a little girl. My mother used to call, oh, you should see this guy. Wait till you see him. Yeah. You know, I think he's doing a show with Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Impersonated Nixon. I'm not a crook. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, what's going on in your world now? You know, what's very interesting um, is that I feel like I'm at the beginning of, I'm embarking on a new piece of my career. I'm very, I, I get these feelings, you know, I'm very intuitive. And I feel like a lot of things, I, I, I look at indications, I call it cliff notes from God. Like when I, I have conversations with people and something sparks, now the kids call it a glimmer. You know how they talk about a trigger, like that, well that triggered yeah, me. Yeah, it was triggered. Yeah, oh I was triggered, I, now I gotta drink or eat or smoke weed or whatever, I was triggered. But there's another thing now that's called a glimmer. And I'm sure as a comic, as a performer, as an entrepreneur, you know when you're talking to somebody and they're like, yeah, you know, my friend's renting an apartment, da 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 da, da. And, and you're thinking, I was just thinking I got to move to that neighbor. Da, 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 follow that cap. You know, right, that right, right. like follow that cap, right? So I've been getting a lot of glimmers because, um, you know, I have, I have 190 million views on TikTok and I'm not on TikTok. That's just young women that my comedy resonates Holy with, shit. that do hashtag money. And those are just the people that tag me. There's millions of views of people that didn't tag me and my fans go after them. I have very good fans. So hashtag Monique Marvez has 190 million views on TikTok. And it's the young girls that are finding me and, and really res I, I resonate with them. So I feel like I'm gonna really focus on growing my social media because now I have a specific, like in my mind, I, I'm not about self-aggrandizement. You know, to me, there's a difference between a star and a celebrity. A celebrity gets a good table. People know their name. They get given gifts. It's nice. I've had those things. I've been a, a minor celebrity when I've been at a, in a radio. You know, when I did radio, my show was number one. People knew me. I'd walk up to a podium, table of two. Are you Monique of Monique and the Man? Yes. Oh, please, let us send you dessert. I've had it. I know what celebrity is. I, I like it. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you use it for good things, it's a wonderful thing, you know? But I'm very secure in the fact that I'm a star. A star is an illuminating body. A star is something you guide by and navigate by. A star is a leader, you know? Being a star is a responsibility and to whom much is given. And I now see that I'm okay with being a celebrity if it's not about me. If my stardom can guide some of these young women out of, you know, FOMO, you know, fear of missing out or comparison or thinking that somebody's having a better life than them. Like I see social media really undercutting everything that my generation and the generation before me 
worked hard to do for young women. I, I agree. So I, I feel agree. like if my voice means something to them and empowers them and takes them in another direction where they're not just showing their butts to get likes, then 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 I'll use it for that. And that's that's my focus now is to use my comedy, my influence, what I do to uh, raise my profile and, and be the Pied Piper of, of young girls doing their lives the, what I believe to be a better way. I like that. It's like I said from the beginning of the podcast, you're very intelligent. Thank you. I never knew there was a difference between the two, but there is. You know, sometimes we get recognized walking down the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I don't really think about what I do too much. I don't sit on a plane and say, oh, I hope somebody recognizes me. Yeah, I, know. I never really think about it until it happens. Mm -hmm. And then I go, oh, oh, yes, yes, I am that guy. Mm -hmm. Aren't you that guy that does this particular joke? And I said, yeah, holy shit. Dude, you just walk right out in the open? And I go, what? You, you just walk out? Don't you have, like, people? And I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't have any people. This most la recent one was the was a trip because I'm standing by baggage claim. Mm -hmm. And I could see the body posture of this man saying to his wife, I have to say something. Mm -hmm. I want to say something. She goes, don't bother him. Don't bother him. Those people, they can be rude. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, she must think I'm some highfalutin celebrity or some shit like this. And the guy goes, hey, man, I don't want to bother you. But I just have to say, you're my fucking favorite, man. Uh -uh. You are hilarious. And I go, I work my ass off to have somebody say something. Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't you say nothing? Oh, my wife, she thinks, you know, you people. I go, we people? All right, I'm in the category? He goes, yeah. So then we just started making small talk. And all of a sudden, my bags come. And I grab my bag. And he goes, you just get your own bags? Mm -mm. And I go, well, who's going to get them? Yeah. And he goes, you don't have people? I go, people to get my bags? I don't want anybody touching my shit. I go, are you under the assumption there's a limousine outside? And he goes, yeah, no, no, it's my father. And he's probably in the car smoking cigarettes. With the windows up. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, that's my life. But I talked to him, and we chatted. And he says, can I get a picture? I said, of course you can get a picture. This made other people come and start going, oh, it is him. Oh, oh, we could so talk cool. to him. So now I'm taking pictures with all these people, and all of a sudden, this big man, for some reason or other, goes, Hey, man, can I hug you? And I go, Huh? I get that. He goes, I just want to know if I could hug you. And I go, Yeah, you can hug me. What do you want to hug me for? And he goes, I just, I just love you. Oh, that's <laughs> so like, nice. That's when I start to say, You know what? I am on my new journey now. Something different's changing. Yeah. I don't. Um, I don't know what the term is. Maybe you do. I don't get the hungriness that I was when I was younger. No, that's not it. Because I'm always hungry. I always want more. I don't have the worry that I'm not going to get work. The concern. I'm not concerned. Yeah. I'm not, I don't think about. Oh, I don't have an agent. Who cares? I don't have a manager. Man, I didn't ever had anybody did anything good anyway. I'm on my journey. I'm cool. I got work. I agree. And I have friends now more friends than I ever had in show business that I actually trust to say, I have this gig, I can't go, did you want it? Mm -hmm. um, I need some help, I need an opening act, I need a friend, uh, did you want to do something with me? Mm -hmm. uh, I have this offer, why don't you take it? I can't go. It's something different about it now. Well, I, I'd like to think that we are learning from the kids because the kids are collaborative, they're not competitive. Mm -hmm. The Gen Zers, which I resonate with completely, you know, the, the concept that there's not enough scarcity brain, dog eat dog, we were raised with that. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Our parents were those people. <clears throat> and, you know, and that came down from their parents, which were Depression era, World War II people, you know. And I, I feel like you have to evolve, you have to grow. I've always been that way. I, I'm not blown, but true fact. I've always helped other people get jobs. I've always tried. And it's funny because my ex-husband used to work at a comedy club until I met him. And he told me once, he said, you know, there's a lot of comics that when you're not around, they talk badly about you. 
the very <laughs> same people that you're so nice to and you get jobs for and blah 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 are not not like I've heard them because for a while we didn't tell anybody we were married so he worked in a prominent comedy club and overheard people talking because my trajectory was so fast I was attractive I had big boobs you know a lot of people talked a lot of, of crap and um and I told them I said if they respect or fear me enough to pretend they like me that's good enough for me don't ever tell me again that somebody doesn't like me and part of it is because people are intimidated when you're so comfortable in your own skin and when you do what you got to do and I've always been like that I mean I, I, I I'm going to attribute it I, I said you know I have a line in my one woman show where I said I my father left me nothing except everything I am and you know oh it's such a great line thank you wow thank you it's very powerful when I say it, it took on like stage. a second for that to sink in my father left me nothing back. except everything I am my dad always told me you can be anything you can do anything you're wonderful whoever gets you is lucky from the time I was a little girl he would tell me amazing things you know and and uh, and I, I remember them so powerfully and so I, I was never, I always ran my own race. I never cared what other people did or how much money. I still don't care how much money people make or, you know, I don't care. I run my own race. You know, I recently got a call. Somebody told me, well, you're the highest paid person that ever did this room. You know, like, this is our max. And I'm like, okay. Like, so what? You know what I mean? Like, this is what I want to come to your room. I don't care what, other, what you paid other people. I'm running my own race. I'm glad that you are the way that you are. Thank you. I always feel sometimes, though, I'm the only one that hears shit like that because I did hear people say to me, you know, those guys that you helped out, they don't have nothing nice to say about you. I'm like, how can that be? No, I'm how can that be? I've been nice to these people. It's about them, not you, Mike. It's so stupid. Honestly, I heard terrible things about you before I met you. <laughs> <laughs> True fact. For real? Yeah. And then I met you, and I was like, and I always formed my own opinion, so I didn't care. So I, I didn't listen because I knew it was like jealousy because you, you send out this great newsletter. I think it's because you're on your game. You got this newsletter. You do this podcast. You work very hard. You created this career from the bootstraps. You know, so you, you do, look, when people go like, oh, he does this Italian thing. Everybody does the Italian thing. Well, guess what? Sebastian Maniscalco does the Italian thing. You know what I mean? And he fills Madison Square Garden and nobody's saying that his stuff is facile or, you know, whatever. So at the end of the, when I met you, because I don't, it's funny to me, if I love the artist, then I then the comedy is automatically better. But if I don't like them, they could be the fun, when people go like, oh my God, I think so-and-so is so funny. And I've met the guy and he's a schmuck. And it's like, I, I just can't laugh because I know he's not, he doesn't intend well for his audience. He doesn't intend well for the human race. He's not a well-intentioned person. You are one of the nicest people I've ever met in this business. Yeah, I've always tried to be just a nice, normal human being. We you come are. from a small, close-knit Italian family, whether people like it or not, and that's the way we were raised. Mm -hmm. This morning I was having breakfast in this uh, restaurant. I was just by myself, and a homeless person came up to the door and said, can I get a couple of dollars for a coffee? And I just went, why don't you just sit right there and have breakfast? Yeah. He came in and he had breakfast and I said to the waiter, because he looked at me as if to say, and I'm like, look, he looks like a normal, regular guy who needs a break. Here's his breakfast money, serve him the breakfast and goodbye. And yeah. I left. That's I, it. I did a similar thing on Christmas Eve. I was picking up fast stuff for a party. I'm at the Rite Aid and there's a homeless guy who is trying to figure out like his points because he felt like he had enough points to get something. Even though he had no money, he had saved his points and he was very excited. Mm -hmm. And somehow the system had changed and the points weren't working and he wasn't able to buy what he wanted to buy. And he was holding up the line and everybody's being impatient and nasty. But I could tell he was excited that I have enough to get the thing I want, even though I don't have any money. So on top of everything else, he was disappointed. Forget the humiliation, forget he's homeless. The profound disappointment that he really thought he was going to get something. Yeah. And I thought, it's Christmas Eve. What the hell? I went up to the woman. I go, what is he trying to get with the points? She tells me, goes, so like 20 something dollars. I'm like, this all is going on for like, stop uh, here. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Well, my, who can you to say who and what club? Said what about you? No, you said that your husband. Oh. Oh, yeah. It's been forever. What club was it? It was it was the Comedy Caravan in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Really? Yeah. I married you married one of a man the managers. from Kentucky? I did. Well, he wasn't from there. He lived there because he was going to college at University of Kentucky. What were you doing there? I was very young. I was performing. This was very early in my career. Tom Sobel introduced us. Rest in peace. So you were performing in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. You meet this man. Meet this young man. And how did you get the relationship going? Long distance? Um, yeah. And he, and he brought me flowers. Um, he later, after we were married, told me that when he saw my poster that he got like a feeling, you know, like people do that. Like he's like, I, I, he's like, I knew I was going to meet you. I knew something was going to happen. I just knew it. I could some, I, I just knew it. Right. And, and, uh, after, because that was back when clubs were Wednesday to Sunday, you know, the whole time. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So we hung out. We went to dinner after the show. I waited, da da da, you know, and um, and he and he didn't want anybody to know that we were hanging out. So he left me flowers, and he told somebody at the door of the club on Sunday night, make sure because it's night off, make sure Monique gets this. Oh, that's my timer. We'll take it off in a minute. It's just because I had a hard out, but I can turn it off. So um. So he told them, make sure Monique gets these. A fan left them for her. And he left me yellow roses with a beautiful message. And we kept in touch, and then we got married. So what did you start it off with a long-distance relationship? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, so who moved where to uh, be married? I moved to Louisville. No kidding. I left Miami. I'm going to turn that off so it doesn't disturb us. Sure. And then we'll... She we'll... has what they call a hard out, means she's supposed to hurry up and leave. But she can't now because we're recording. Yeah, no, we'll stick the landing. We're going to stick the go. landing. <laughs> I love her terminology. That's radio. She reads so many books. Hard out is radio. Hard out? Hard out is I didn't, radio. I never even, I got off. You, know, you don't even want to know what I think that is. But anyway. <laughs> so, so interestingly enough, yes, we, um, I, mo I moved to Louisville briefly. And then he went on the road with me. And it was one of those beautiful things where... You know, had I not met him, I was so entrenched in Miami. I had this whole open mic. I had already surpassed that. I was a headliner. But I had all of these clubs that I was, like, running stuff on South Beach. I had all these gay clubs that I was running open mic night. Like, I had a little fiefdom going. So you're a hustler. Yeah, and I would have gotten stuck there. You know you know what I mean? Like, you get comfortable. Big fish, small pond, you know. Yeah. But, and, and, and meeting him kind of was the, the thing that yanked me. And he and his father lived in San Diego and when we were first talking about getting married we agreed to go to Louisville for a short time and I said you know if, if this all works out we'll both end up because he loved California I said we'll both end up back in you know you'll end up back in California I'll end up in California and that's so that's a great deal yeah it was a good deal all right and we're still friends he, he um I mean we don't we don't hang out or talk or anything because he's married with children and Etc. But recently, he was in a comedy club in uh, Orlando, which is where he lives now, and a dear friend of mine, Dave Williamson, who I had just worked with at the Ice House, was like, you know, I'm from Miami originally. I'm a comedian, da da, da L.A. And after the show, my ex-husband, who was evidently there with his wife, said, you probably you've got to know my ex-wife if you're from Miami, da, da. So Dave Williamson sent me a picture of him with my ex-husband. And I said, please tell me that you told them that I still look really good. Because I told them that you were still lovely, but that you're still very much a crusher. You're still funny. You haven't gotten she's lazy. She's a crusher. I'm a crusher. She's a crusher. She's good looking. She's fantastic. And Aww. she's smart. Thank she's one you, of the top man. female comedians on the planet. Thank you. You were married more than once? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Does that act. mean two more? Yeah. I'm my high school sweetheart. Then I married... For real love, like I really loved my second husband. We have like a thing. That's why I know when he saw Dave Williams and he was happy. My third husband, to be candid, I only married because I wanted a child. I'm old school, Latina, Catholic. I mean, I was raised that way. You don't just like now. You just freeze your eggs and you, you right, know, buy right, some okay. sea monkeys and you rent that chick's uterus because she's not using it, you know. But, uh, you know, I was 40. I married. It didn't work out. He's not a bad person. But I just say a decision made in fear is a bad decision. I married him because I heard the clock ticking. I was not in love with him. He's a lovely person. But when I realized not only did I not want to have a kid with him, it was the last thing I wanted. So I, I secretly stopped giving myself shots in the leg. I went back on the pill and I figured out what's it going to cost me to get rid of him. <laughs> it was a lot of money, Mike. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So much money. I okay. paid alimony for two years. To get rid of somebody? You can't yeah. just say, hey, look, I'm not, not happy. California is a community property state, and I was making a lot of money. I was writing for television. Wow. I had to give him a lot of money. It's okay. I don't care. I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, did you end up having the kids? No. No, I have no children. No. And I'm fine with that. I have nieces and I adore them. Yes, I have nieces. I adore them. And I'm Uncle Mike and that's it. Yep, yep, yep. That thing never happened in my life. Who knows why? Mm -hmm. People say to all the time, you didn't get married because of showbiz. I'm like, no, in my 20s, I'm 30s. I wasn't doing any of this. I was an actor in New York. I was always around. Yep. I was more into surfing in the Jersey Shore than I was anything else. Right, right. And now it's kind of like, well... <laughs> I'm you happy. Never know. Alan know. Havey got married late in life. Right. Alan got married really late, and he's super happy. Well, I love entertaining with you. I love Thank the you. fact that we were doing shows together in Florida. Uh -huh. I have some more shows in Florida. Are you on those shows, too? I don't know. I'll have to look. The last week of February. No. It's another rap agency show. Nope. So I figured. I'll miss you. All right. Well, if you're going to be in Florida, I do have some I other March shows. 10th. I don't have anything in March. Okay. Not in Florida. Okay. We'll keep in touch. All right. Well, Thank we'll end you. up doing something together because we have we a lot will. of friends in common. And I enjoy working with people that I have fun being around. I feel the same. You know, you, you ever get tortured with other comedians and you're kind of like, this sucks, man. Very rarely this now. This sucks. Very no, rarely. No, because sometimes you're backstage. You know, I'm going to do this much time. And I'm like, it's not about the time. Why you got to talk to me like that? It's not about how much time you do. It's what you did with the time. Amen. You don't have to stretch to try to push me down. You're going to hurt yourself. You know who I am? <laughs> One of the last clubs I was at, the MC and the feature didn't show up. Crazy. They didn't show up. Crazy. So the manager said to me, what do you want me to do? You want me to call somebody? I'm like, no. In fact, tell them not to come tomorrow night either and say my name. Yeah. And I went on stage and I did the whole 90. Yeah. We can and, do and that. And then I go, and give me their money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did a Fringe Festival one-woman show. It was 90 minutes. I did it, you know, 14 performances <laughs> twice, in, twice a night. That's a lot. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of work. Yeah. I'm glad you're still enjoying touring. You know, some love people it. get to the point where they're like, look, I really don't want to go anymore. Yeah. I love going. Yeah. I can't wait to go. I wish I could work on the ships with someone like yourself Aww. because I do do ships, but I, you know, those ships where you do two comedians and you only do it to like 25 minutes, Royal. like the Royal <laughs> yeah, on yeah, the yeah. Oasis. Yeah, I if love you, those. If you're with another comedian, you can have fun during the day. Absolutely. You can write jokes for each I've other. You make with videos Mike for each other. I've done them. I've done the, the Royal with other comics and it was always a good time. And <clears throat> what we do when we're on these particular ships is there's no headliner. Everybody's created equal. Absolutely. You can flip-flop. Who wants to go first? Who yep. wants to go last? Yep. Um, sometimes you're with people who say, well, I have to close every show because that's what I do. And I go, yeah, go ahead. Because while you're on stage, I'm going to go see the water show or something like yeah, that. Yeah, My yeah. ego is out the door. I don't really give a shit. Absolutely. And then you're with people who say, hey, well, let's flip-flop or let's do something funny or you want to try something together. Yeah, exactly. I've had There's those this one comedian I think you know. And I had the greatest two weeks with her. Because she was a little bit on the chicken shit side when it came mm. to flip-flopping the show. And after the show, she wanted to go to her room. And I said, why are you doing that? Who, who these is people could, tell me now. These people could be your fans. You gotta Let's go me. to the restaurant. Let's go to the beach. Yeah. Let's be do seen. Things. Let everybody talk to you. Yes. Because that's what I'm going to do. That's what I do. I'm collecting everybody's phone number. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking pictures with everybody. Because when I go on land, they're all going to find out where I'm going. That's right. I got you. Got to tell me who is it? Vanessa Hollingshead. Yeah, she's very sweet. I haven't seen her in a long time though. But I think you guys did the show. She no, she did it before me because there's okay. been four iterations of funny women of a certain okay. age. But yeah, she's done it and she's very nice. Well, here's Mike Marino. You ready? Ready. So we did a couple of shows and she goes, "Wow, you're so strong. You're so this. You're so that." And I go, "Yeah, but you're closing every show for the rest of the week. So let's go get you, pick up your pants." Yeah. And she goes, "Well, you know, I'm like, no." to fucking put your pants on let's go mm -hmm. and then when the show's over you're not going to your room we're going out we're gonna go say hi we're gonna go shake hands i want your fans to go over and hug you and say hello to you and, yep. and ask you for your website and shit like that and she's like oh wow i can't believe it i can't believe it yeah and and she was crushing it yeah crushing it lenny bruce said it take the country one block at a time yeah and we're still good friends. And I know she talks about that all the time because she tells everybody, she goes, he wouldn't let me go back to my room. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be seen. Yep. You got to have some fun. It's part of our job. And why are you worried? Yeah. Because when we do go on these ships, if you're with some other comedians that you have a great chemistry with, they're going to write a joke for you that you never saw coming. That's right. 
And, and you got to put your ego aside because another comedian could come up with something really cool for you. Absolutely. And you take that bitch. And then um, somebody wrote me one word in a joke. And I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. He goes, come on, make me happy. Just do it. And it was changing the word from canoe to kayak. It's in a, it's in a joke. And I changed it to kayak, and it got the hugest laughs. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. And I said it into the microphone on stage, and I hear him going, I told you. Yeah, because K sounds are funny. Kayak has two Ks. She's the, second person that, she's the second person that said that to me this week. That's what Craig Schumacher said. Of course, because Craig knows what's up. It's like I make young people that I'm mentoring watch the Sunshine Boys. If they get why that's a great movie, I'll work with them. If they don't, I'm not interested. Holy shit. Yeah, cupcake. You're too intelligent. <laughs> You're too intelligent, man. What's on the rise for you now? What are you working on? Oh, so many wonderful things. Um, I, uh, I, I've shot a, a sizzle for a... I don't even want to tell you. I'll tell you next time. But I shot a sizzle that has some interest. And I've, I have a relationship going with a woman that we've been talking for eight years because she was the showrunner for Reba, Allison Gibson. And she's like, you're a personality. You're a show. we got to figure something out. Yeah. So I've been, I've been you know, I'm going to just tell you something about being a woman that's different than being a man. From 47, 46, you know, Christine Baranski was still in the Grinch in her 40s and still the hot chick. But from about 46 to 58, as a woman in Hollywood, you're kind of, I don't want to say invisible, but things are a little different. And then you hit, and you can see it in American Horror Story with Jessica Lange, you hit a certain age where you've managed to keep your ass in your face in the right place, you got something to say, you're a new category, let's call it the anti-ingenue. You know, you're the wise woman who's still got it going on, and then you're like there. So, like the casting agents from Hacks reached out, like right now, I've got stuff going on. I finally made it over that chasm and good, good things are manifesting on their own organically. I so agree with that. And that's a great word. I don't think I've ever heard that word. How'd you say it again? Which one? anti azinism The uh, anti-ingenue. The, the anti anti-ingenue. Wow. You like She's that She's a one? walking dictionary. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And as a blue collar mook from New Jersey, I don't even know what it means. It just sounded so cool. Well, the young pretty girl <laughs> in the movie back in the day was called the ingenue. Yeah, yeah, it was ingenue. like Audrey Hepburn is the forever, the ultimate ingenue. So the anti-ingenue would be like you still have, have it going on, but you're, you know. You know what I got I to gotta bring up and then we're going to get out of here? Thank you. What do you think of the uh, stuff that's going on, on the internet with the Cat Williams show and Cat Williams being part of that, what he was saying, and now Monique was on the show and they're all going to take jabs at each other now? Well, well, here's, I don't know, I could look at it one of two ways, that they've looked at Jeffrey Ross and said, you know what, when white people you know, take the piss and vinegar out of each other, it's a big thing. So maybe this is the African-American version of roast battles, just right. like taking the piss out of each other. Okay, great, fine, whatever. If everybody's in on it, then that's okay, fine, great. But if it's just mean-spirited dissing of other acts, then I, I don't see what the benefit. Like at a certain age, it sounds so funny, but I like The Crown, right? The show The Crown. And whenever the queen was going to say something, when she was very old or getting older, the queen mother who died at 100 would say, you know, you got to ask yourself the three things is the queen. You know, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? Do you need to say it? You know, when she was talking about that horrible year in 92, da da da. And, and you know, that, invul that, that vulnerability. You know, you're the queen. You're not supposed to be vulnerable. So the mom would always like coach her. My thing is, in my mind, I ask myself before something comes out of my mouth, how is that helpful? Yeah. How is that helpful? How is saying yeah. that going to benefit anyone that hears it? Mm hmm. I get you. You are intelligent, young lady. <laughs> Thank you, She's Mike. smart. Thank She's you. the anti ingenue. That's me. Did I say it right? Yeah, you said the it anti -ingenue. perfectly. Anti ingenue. I like that. That's Please right. tell everybody where they can follow you and watch what you're doing on social media. Thank you. At Monique Marvez on all of them. I At use my own name because I'm the only Monique Marvez. That's it. Monique Marvez. Monique Marvez. M A R V as in Victor, E Z as in Zebra. I have a Monique Marvez official fan page on Facebook. Uh, because I maxed out at the 5,000, so I had to start another page. So it's very hard to just do at Monique Marvez on Facebook, but only on Facebook, Monique Marvez official fan page. Everything else, Insta, uh, 
the, 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 the Chinese spyware, the TikTok, yeah, at Monique. It's all at Monique Marvez. Make sure you guys follow. I want to thank Monique for coming down the basement. Right. Thank you. I'm going to hurry up and give her her heart out so she can get out of here. Thank you. And I'm going to rewatch this later on so that I can remember all these <laughs> anti agenu <laughs> book smart, intelligent, thank gorgeous you. things. Thank you, Mike. All right, we got to get going. I want to thank my producer, Tatiana Blue Shell, for always making sure we put together a great podcast and bringing in some great guests and doing everything right. Let's make America Italian again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know why she's laughing. <laughs> I'm all I'm in on it. She's gonna be in the series too. Watch Absolutely. This shit. Remember, you don't know nothing, you don't see nothing, you don't say nothing. And how do I end every single one of my podcasts by saying the same thing with my guest? Mm. Don't take more shit from nobody. <laughs> you, you, you ready? Ready. Don't take no, no we say shit. it together. Oh, we say it together? Okay. Yeah. Don't, don't take, take no shit, shit from, from nobody. nobody. <laughs> see the way she put her hand in there? She <laughs> that yeah. means you really can't take no yeah, shit. Yeah, no, I know the Brooklyn finger. You <laughs> Hey folks, thanks for watching live from my mother's basement. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, hit the word like and leave me a really cool comment. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the future episodes and you can watch some of the funniest videos on the internet. You can also listen to the show on Spotify or your favorite podcast app.